Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the United States Department of Education's negotiated rulemaking with the Affordability and Student Loans Committee's third session, session three. My name is Kayla Mack, and I'm from the Federal Mediation and Conciliation Service, and I and my team will be facilitating this morning's proceedings. As we get started, I want to turn it directly over to the department's federal negotiator, Ms. Jennifer Hong, for her introduction and any opening remarks that she may want to make. Jennifer, please. Great, right, thank you, Kayla. I just wanted to say good morning and welcome everybody back to our third and final session of negotiated rulemaking on the affordability and student loans table. Again, my name is Jennifer Hong and I'm the federal negotiator representing the department on these issues. Uh, I just like to express my gratitude on behalf of the department on the work that has gone into thinking about the numerous agenda items for this rulemaking and that we look forward to a productive third session with the ultimate goal of reaching consensus on the issues before you. Uh, you'll note that between sessions two and three, we've made every attempt to take your proposals under thoughtful consideration. And in looking back throughout the course of this rulemaking, you'll notice that we have taken many of your suggestions and incorporated them into the proposed regulatory text. I look forward to discussing these further with you. Thank you. All right, thank you, Jennifer. Now, throughout this week, we may at certain times be joined by several non-consensus taking participants from the department's um, Office of General Counsel. Those individuals are Mr. Brian Siegel, Todd Davis, and Soren Lagarde. I believe we have Brian with us this morning. Good morning, Brian. Good morning, everyone. Thanks, Brian. We'll also have from the department throughout this week, Mr. Aaron Washington and Ms. Vanessa Gomez, who will be screen sharing documents and perhaps participating in live editing as we review the proposed regulatory text. Vanessa and Aaron, good morning. Morning, everyone. Morning, everyone. All right. So thank you um, from those of you from the department. Next, I would like to briefly reintroduce the esteemed members of our Affordability and Student Loans Committee. So again, we'll go through each constituency and invite the primary negotiator and the alternate negotiator to briefly check in with us. So for the constituency group accrediting agencies, we have our primary, Dr. Heather Perfetti. Good morning, everyone. Heather Perfetti here, president of the Middle States Commission on Higher Education. Thank you, Heather. And our alternate, um, Dr. Michael McComas. Uh, good morning, Michael McComas, executive director with the Accrediting Commission of Career Schools and Colleges. Thank you, Michael. For the constituency of dependent students, we have our primary, Ms. Dixie Samaniego. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Dixie. I serve as the Chief Governmental Officer for Cal State Fullerton's ASI and also the Vice Chair of Legislative Affairs for the Cal State Student Association. And Greg won't be with us this week. Okay, thank you for letting us know, um, Dixie. So we will not have alternate Mr. Greg Norwood with us. Next for the constituency group, um, Federal Family Education Loan Lenders and or Guarantee Agencies, we have our primary, Ms. Jay O'Connell. Morning, Jay O'Connell. I'm the Director of Compliance at Vermont Student Assistance Corporation. Nice to see you. Thank you, Jay. And we have our alternate, Mr. Will Schaffner. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to week three. Uh, it's, it's getting down to the crunch here. Uh, I'm Will Shopner, Director of Business Development and Government Relations at Mohila, and it's an honor to be with you guys today. Thanks. Thank you, Will. For constituency group financial aid administrators at post-secondary institutions, we have our primary, Mr. Daniel Barkowitz. Hello, everyone, and happy holidays. It's Daniel Barkowitz, Assistant Vice President of Financial Aid and Veterans Affairs at Valencia College in beautiful Orlando, Florida, uh, and happy to be with you for another week uh, where the rest of you have snow, we have gorgeous weather. Come visit us in Orlando. Thank you for reminding us, Daniel. And we have our alternate, Miss Alyssa, Alyssa Dobson. Good morning, everybody. Alyssa Dobson, the Director of Financial Aid and Scholarships at Slippery Rock University. Thanks, Alyssa. For the constituency group for your public institutions, we have our primary, Dr. Marjorie Doreen Williams. Good morning, everyone. It's Dr. Marjorie Doreen Williams, Assistant Professor at the University of Missouri-Columbia. Glad to be here again. 
Thanks, Marjorie. And we have our alternate, Rachel Feldman, who will be joining us later in today's session. For our constituency group, independent students, we have our primary, Ms. Michaela Martin. Hey, Michaela, and uh, today it'll be 71 in Southern California. Danielle, left coast is the best coast. Claude Veer today. Thanks, Michaela. And we also have our alternate, Dr. Stanley Andres. Good morning, everyone. Stan Andres, uh, assistant professor at Howard University College of Medicine and the executive director of From Prison Cells to PhD. Pleasure to be with you all. Our pleasure to be here with you all. Thank you, Stan. For our constituency group, individuals with disabilities or groups representing them, we have our primary, Ms. Bethany Lilly. Good morning, everyone. Bethany Lilly with the ARC of the United States here on behalf of the Consortium for Citizens with Disabilities. Hope everybody has plenty of coffee. Thank you, Bethany. And we have our alternate, Mr. John Whitelaw. Good morning, everyone. John Whitelaw, Advocacy Director at Community Legal Aid Society in Delaware. Thank you. Thank you, John. For our constituency group, legal assistance organizations that represent students and or borrowers, we have our primary, Ms. Persis Siu. Hello, everyone. Nice to be here today. Um, Persis Siu for Legal Aid um, of the National Consumer Law Center. Thank you, Persis. And we have our alternate, Mr. Joshua Rovinger. Morning, everyone. Josh Rovinger from the Legal Aid Society of Cleveland, uh, pronouns he, him. Uh, great to see everyone. Thank you, Josh. For the constituency group representing my minority serving institutions, we have Ms. Noelia Gonzalez. Good morning, Noelia Gonzalez. I'm the interim um, system wide director for the California State University system. Thank you. Thank you, Noelia. For private nonprofit institutions, we have our primary, Ms. Misty Sabuna. Hey everyone, Misty Sabuni, um, Associate Vice President of uh, Financial Literacy at Southern New Hampshire University, and I'm excited to be here with you all for week three. You made it. Thanks, Misty. And we have our alternate, Dr. Terrence McTeer, Jr. Uh, good morning, everyone. Right. For proprietary institutions, we have our primary, Ms. Jessica Berry. Hello everyone, I'm Jessica Berry, President of the Modern College of Design in Kettering, Ohio. I'm pleased to be with you this week. Thank you, Jessica. And we have our alternate, Dr. Carol Colvin. Good morning, everyone. I'm Carol Colvin, and I'm the Senior Vice President of Financial Aid for South College. All right. For our constituency group representing state's attorneys general, we have our primary, Mr. Joseph Sanders. Good morning, everyone. Um, Joe Sanders on behalf of State AGs. Uh, it's an honor to be here and to uh, work on the final week of the rulemaking with everyone. Looking forward to it. Thank you, Joe. And we have the alternate, Mr. Eric Apar. Hi, everyone. I'm Eric Apar. I'm the Assistant Deputy Director for Policy and Strategic Planning at the New Jersey Division of Consumer Affairs. Really good to see you all again. Thanks, Eric. For state higher education executive officers, state authorizing agencies, and or state regula regulators, we have primary Dr. David Tanberg. Hi, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be with you today. Um, David Tanberg, Senior Vice President of Policy Research and Strategic Initiatives at the State Higher Education Executive Officers Association, more commonly known as GEO. Thank you, David. And we have our alternate, Ms. Suzanne Martindale. Greetings from a very, very foggy Oakland, California. <laughs> this is Suzanne Martindale. I'm the Senior Deputy Commissioner over at the California Department of Financial Protection and Innovation. Great to be with you. Thanks, Suzanne. For student loan borrowers, we have our primary, Ms. Jerry O'Brien Losey. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to never sunny Albany, New York. Um, and I look forward to this last session with everyone. Thanks, Jerry. And we have Ms. Jennifer Cardenas as alternate. Uh, buenos dias, good morning. Yes, Jennifer Cardenas, she, her. Um, I'm an outreach specialist for Young Invincibles here in California. Thanks, Jen. For constituency group two-year public institutions, we have our primary, Dr. Robert Ayala. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Bobby Ayala here. Uh, glad to see everybody. And we have our alternate, Dr. Christina Tangalakis. Good morning from Los Angeles. Um, 
I'm the Associate Dean of Financial Aid at Glendale College. Uh, looking forward to uh, finishing strong this week. Thank you. And for our constituency group, United States service members, veterans, or groups representing them, we have our primary, Mr. Justin Hostrad. Morning, everybody. Looking forward to being here with you in this uh, third and final week. Thanks, Justin. And we have our alternate, Ms. Emily DeVito. Hi, good morning and happy December, Emily DeVito. I am the Associate Director of the National Legislative Service for the Veterans of Foreign Wars, the VFW's uh, Washington, D.C. office. Thank you, Emily. Now we have one additional committee member to introduce to you all for session three. Uh, Ms. Ann Precythe was nominated and approved by this committee during our second session back in November. She's now accepted her nomination to the committee and joins us this morning. So I want to uh, welcome Ms. Precythe and ask her to introduce herself to the committee. Thank you, Kayla. My name is Ann Precythe, and I'm the current president for the Correctional Leaders Association and the director of corrections in the state of Missouri. And I'm very honored to be here. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Ann. And thank you to all of the committee members for going through that, checking in with us, introducing yourselves and being here today. Next, we would like to take the opportunity to introduce to you all or reintroduce to you all our two expert advisors who continue to provide experience and research-based data information and recommendations to the committee. I would like to welcome the advisor on qualifying employers on the topic of public service loan forgiveness, Ms. Heather Jarvis. Good morning, everyone. Heather Jarvis. I am a private attorney specializing in student loans and executive director of Foster Us. Thank you, Heather. And I'd also like to take this opportunity to welcome the advisor on economic and or higher education data, Dr. Rajiv Darolia. Good morning, Raj Darolia, faculty at the University of Kentucky. Go be blue. Thank you, Raj. Uh, thank you again to both of our advisors. Last, I would like to remind you all of your FMCS facilitation team. We're here this week again as a third party neutral. We will help with hosting and running the technology and the platform, facilitating the discussions and taking consensus decision making checks this week, operating within the protocols, working with the committee as appropriate in breakouts and caucuses and spaces during the session, soliciting and distributing any information and data and documents that need to be shared out, and really assisting you all in a meaningful and productive way throughout the process. I've already introduced myself as Kayla Mack. I would like to round out the introductions with my team, Ms. Cindy Jeffries. Good morning, everyone, and welcome back. And Mr. Brady Roberts. Good morning, everyone. Happy to be here. And last but certainly not least, I'd like to introduce you all to FMCS Mediation Technology Specialist, Mr. Kevin Hawkins, who is here to support our facilitation team's efforts this week. Good morning, everyone. Happy to be with you. All right. Thank you, Kevin. Before we go ahead and jump into our substantive issues, we have a few reminders. Please make sure that your naming convention on screen matches that of what we've been doing in sessions one and two. We invite you all to share your first name, how you'd like to be referred in lieu of a first name if you have a different preference, P or an A for primary or alternate, and an abbreviated reference to your constituency group. This helps us easily identify you, but also assists the viewing public with knowing who we all are. While you're not speaking, we do ask that you remain on mute. You've all done a wonderful job of this thus far, but that helps cut down on any background noise or distractions. If you're at the main virtual table, and want to speak, please raise that virtual hand that'll throw you up in a particular order. If you lower your hand and re-raise it, it'll take you to the end of the line. Please know at all times we're tracking those um, and we'll call on you in the order that you appear on, on our screen. Unless we ever need to deviate to that to jump back to the department or to general counsel for a quick comment or response that would assist us in moving forward with the dialogue. Should you have any technology related issues, questions or concerns, please don't hesitate to message Brady in the chat or send him a quick email and he'll share his email address right now um, in the chat so that you all have that. The chat feature will remain enabled as it has in our prior sessions. Keep in mind any message placed in the chat 
that goes out to everyone is going to be subject to our ongoing um, developing transcript that will be that will ultimately be posted online for all to see. Each day, the public has the opportunity to view and observe and watch our work here. The department has posted a registration link for that on their website. We can again post a link um, in the chat for all to see, Brady, if you'll do that, greatly appreciate it. Not only is that where the public registers to watch the proceedings, but that's where we can find all of the documentation that has been shared out with the committee thus far. Consistent with our prior sessions, we're going to invite only our primary um, negotiators to remain on screen during deliberations. If at any time an alternate is going to substitute in for their primary or is being invited by the primary to comment on something, we would ask that they come on screen so that when they're sharing out, everyone can see. Same thing for the advisors. At some point, we'll ask you to turn off your cameras. But when we're inviting you back to the main table or you have something to share, again, we'll ask you to turn those, those cameras on. This will help us all know who is at the main, main table for purposes of consensus decision making, because we're going to get there this session. We are going to engage. Let's talk about that for a moment because it came up um, earlier and I want to make sure that we're all on the same page. We're going to engage in consensus decision making um, to develop proposed regulations. We are going to utilize good faith group problem solving to address the interest of you all as committee members and ultimately hopefully reach unanimous agreement otherwise described as building consensus. It's not a majority vote but rather an expression of agreement or dissent and we have built consensus once there is no consent by any of the committee members. So no individuals can be outvoted because again, it's not a vote. We are only in consensus if everyone is on the same page. A few important notes here about consensus decision making. For the protocols, members of the committee should not block or withhold consensus unless they have serious reservations about what is being proposed. So if when we take a consensus check, and you are in fact a blocker or a down thumb, which I'll cover the thumbs again in a second, we are going to ask you at that time to articulate your serious reservation about what is being proposed and also offer up a tweak, an idea or an alternative that could actually get you to a place of consensus on that issue. To take the consensus checks, we are gonna use the three thumb approach. So uh, this is an expression of agreement. OK, so this means you are in agreement with and fully support what is being proposed. We've utilized in our temperature checks the sideways thumb, and we will do that with consensus as well. This is also an expression of agreement. It is, in fact, an indication that you don't feel as strongly as you might if you were up here. But this does mean that you will fully support the proposal at hand and you are in, in fact, in consensus. Then we have the down one. This is an expression of dissent. This means that you do have a serious reservation. And again, when you are down, we will ask you to express or articulate for the committee that serious reservation and articulate what would help you get to here and be in consensus with the rest of the committee. As the protocols provide, and as we've chatted several times in prior sessions, we are going to take consensus checks on each of the issues separately. There are 12 issues, so we will be taking 12 consensus checks. For some of the issues, they are have been combined in issue papers. For instance, for example, the borrower defense, six, seven, and eight are in fact in papers together. When we get to a point where we are taking consensus on issue six, seven, or eight, we will ask the department to clearly outline what is being included within issue six for purposes of consensus. That way the committee is very clear on what in fact they are taking a consensus check on at that time. But again, separate consensus checks for each of the issues. So there will ultimately be 12. We are not grouping them or tying them together. So we will be asking you to only block if you have a serious reservation about that proposal for that issue. All right. Um, in prior sessions, we took a lot of temperature checks. This being our third and final session together, we are moving forward to a fit official consensus decision making. We will continue to remind you of that 
But again, no more temperature checks. We're gonna be taking official consensus decision-making checks. Stan, I see your hand. Yes, I had a quick question in that regard, if that's okay. Please. Um, so for any given issue, will we take temperature checks within that issue? Like will we take sections to check before we, as we move through to a final official consensus? At this time, that's not the plan, Stan. Instead, what we'll, we will be doing is asking the department to walk us through the entirety of the issue paper and reg text on a particular issue and then move to a consensus check. If we find that we're not in consensus and we need to revisit um, certain pieces, it may make sense to take temperature checks to advise where we are, but the intent is not to utilize at this point temperature checks but only consensus checks. Does that answer your question, Sam? Yes, and I guess just, uh, I mean, there will be discussion all throughout on the different points. So I guess if there was, you know, you know, it would be brought up that, um, you know, something may not be a consensus because of a particular point, as well as at the point of consensus, someone would also bring it up, but it would have already been discussed as well. Yeah, we're going to walk through the issue papers. We will discuss those. We will move to a consensus check. If anyone is in fact a block on the consensus so that we're not in consensus, we will revisit the points that are leading anyone and everyone to be down. Yes. OK, perfect. Uh, Persis, please. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Uh, and how will when we get to the consensus check, how will the consensus checks be recorded for the transcript? So if we're reaching consensus, everyone will be here or here, then we will note that everyone um, has approved, right? And is in an agreement. If anyone is blocked, it'll be in the transcripts because we will be calling on those individuals to articulate why they are a blocker, what their serious reservation is, and what their idea is to lead the committee to consensus. All of that dialogue will be part of the transcript. Is there any way that we could instead do a roll call as we are so that each constituency is on the record um, on their particular vote on each particular issue? We can consider that. Let me chat with um, my team when we get to, to a break and we could consider going through a roll call and calling on each constituency to express where they are in terms of the consensus check. I would appreciate that, thank you. Yep, Justin, please. Thanks so much. Will there be an opportunity? It sounds like the department or the facilitators perhaps uh, intend to follow up with folks that are blocking consensus. We're not comfortable with consensus. Will there be an opportunity at that point for other negotiators to seek clarity um, from those blocking census of, uh, consensus as well? After we invite an individual to articulate um, what their serious reservation is, and what ideas they have for moving the committee to consensus, the dialogue will open up to the full committee. So if there are clarifying questions or more comments to make, we'll engage in that dialogue as we continue to um, seek consensus. David. Yeah, I was just addressing the issue that Persis raised. Um, I, I like the idea of a roll call where we express um, our vote. Um, if that's not possible, I would at least like um, the transcript to record whether uh, there are sideways up or down. There is a difference between us. I know for the consensus, sideways or up is recorded the same way, but it is an expression of a different um, feeling in regards to the proposal. So at a minimum, let's have that recorded would be my suggestion if it's not a full roll call. OK. Thank you, David. Heather. So I guess I'm just needing some clarification in terms of the consensus check. If there are thumbs down, do you anticipate another call for consensus after discussion? And how do we know when the call for the final consensus check will happen. 
So I imagine that we will um, approach that on a case by case basis. If we have, for instance, one individual who has a downward thumb, they articulate their serious reservation, offer a suggestion as to how they could reach consensus. We may, it may make sense right then and there for us then to take another official consensus check. If there are multiple thumbs down and multiple issues that we need to try to work through, we may at some point continue that dialogue and then reach a place where we pause and return to that issue at a later time. Again, I think it will depend on the nature of the issue and the nature of the serious reservations and ideas to get us to consensus. But at every juncture, we as the facilitation team will make it clear to you all that we are taking an official consensus check, what we are taking a check on, when we are pausing the issue, and when we hope to return to it. Keep in mind that we're we're in our final session, so we're going to constantly be balancing moving you forward, right, and making progress, but also making sure that you're prepared to take these consensus checks and we've addressed everything to, to folks' satisfaction. Daniel. So this is a question both for me, but also on behalf of Anne, who's new to this conversation. And again, welcome Anne to the table. Um, what is the impact specifically of an abstention? So I'm imagining that for someone, again, just like Anne, who's not been part of the, the conversation to date, may not have the background. If she or I or anyone at the table chooses not to vote, I'm just trying to get on record the official impact of an abstention on consensus reaching. What strikes me there, Daniel, is we have talked about or the protocols contemplate anyone who is absent or not participating in consensus that is deemed to to move it forward and be in consensus. It is not the same as dissent. So at any time, if a constituency isn't represented at the table and we take an official consensus check, their constituency is deemed to um, move that forward and be in consensus. Thank you. I just wanted, to, for the record, I wanted to make sure that that was clear. Um, Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Anyone else at this point have a question or comment? Okay, all right. The last piece that I want to remind you all is, Again, our facilitation team is going to continue to push you forward through the issues so that we can make progress and make sure that we get through everything that we intend to get through this week. However, if we are ever asking you to take an official consensus check and you need a moment to process, to think, we want to empower you all to raise your hand and let us know that you do in fact need a moment. Okay, we don't want anyone to feel pressured into taking a consensus check at this very moment. Again, we're going to be trying to balance all of the issues in our limited time together in this third session and want to make sure that we cover everything. So again, if we are pushing you through to consensus and you need a moment, please raise your hand and let us know you are all empowered to do so. Okay, we will have public comments at the end of each day, the same way that we have for the last um, 30 minutes, folks are signing up for that. You all have the agenda. So this morning we'll be starting with total and permanent disability discharge, issue number one, and then moving into issue number two, closed school discharge. You will notice that we have placed as the sixth issue to address the Pell Grant eligibility. Please note that the department and the subcommittee members who are presenting have worked together. You are going to be receiving a presentation from the subcommittee Wednesday at 11. So we may have to modify the order just a bit because we will be doing that presentation at that time, regardless of where um, we happen to be with the other issues at that time. So again, plan on that presentation at 11 o'clock on Wednesday. Okay, with that, I am happy to turn us over to Jennifer so that we can begin walking through our first substantive issue. Again, you have the paper on this. This is issue number one, total and permanent disability discharge. I'm gonna ask everyone who's not at the main table at this time to please turn off their cameras. All right, Jennifer, can I turn it over to you? Yes, thank you, Kayla. Um, Happy to jump into our first issue, uh, total permanent disability discharge. This is 
<clears throat> excuse me, as you'll notice, a 21 page document of proposed regulatory text. It has grown uh, because in sessions one and two, we provided direct loan text. Um, total permanent disability discharge affects all three loan programs, including Perkins and Fell. So we have provided the conforming language for those programs. But, and I will go over those with you as well, but I'm gonna ask if we could cue the reg language for TPD, if we could start off um, where we left off on the direct loan program on page 16. Um, that way we can flag the areas that have changed. And then I can go back and talk us through um, the conforming changes that are made to Perkins and Fell. Perfect, thank you, Vanessa. So if you, we've highlighted uh, changes from session two to three. So if you wanna go ahead and scroll down um, to page midpoint, page 17, uh, under Romanet three, we have added a new C, and this was one of the points that was brought up at the last session, and we've discussed this um, in greater detail with, um, with Bethany, is the inclusion of uh, disability onset date of five years prior. Um, so we have included that language. I'll just read it out loud. Under C, the borrower, well, let me read the, the, the preceding language. So we have an aroma at three, an SSA benefit planning query or BPQI or an SSA notice of award or other documentation deemed acceptable by the secretary indicating that A, um, we talked about the qualification um, uh, documentation for SSDI and SSI. Um, B um, is the inclusion of language that the next scheduled disability review will be within three years um, and that the borrower's eligibility for disability benefits in the three year review category, category has been renewed at least once, thereby meeting the five year statutory requirement. And then again, C is the new language that we've included to encompass that a borrower has a disability onset date for SSDI or SSI of at least five years prior or has been receiving benefits for at least five years prior to the application for TPD. And then what follows just minor technical reordering um, uh, uh, changes for D and E. D is the compassion allowance uh, program and E is for retirement benefits. So that is the major substantive change. Um, if you go to page 18 and 19, the highlighted um, just is a technical adjustment to ensure that we're cross-referencing everything under Romanet 3. In other words, all the documentation that we um, are accepting for TPD discharge. Lastly, um, on page 21, uh, the highlighted um, language under discharge without an application, again, to conform with um, everything under uh, paragraph B2, Roman at three, to include uh, the new addition of the disability onset five years prior. Please do keep in mind, however, that we have not um, we have not gotten confirmation if and when uh, we can use disability onset date for purposes of auto discharge. And I wanna make that very clear so that we, the language is there to provide it when it does become available, but we, we don't know and we don't know um, how far into the future we will be able to get those data. Now, and thank you, Vanessa, for Bearing with me, I'm going to ask that we go back to page one. So now that we captured the major substance change, which is really the inclusion of the five year prior, um, I just want to point out that we've made conforming changes in the Perkins loan program. So, um, and I can go through these quickly. Um, on page two, uh, it's the inclusion of the language 
for a certified nurse practitioner, phys physician's assistant, or licensed certified psychologist. Again, BPQI, um, three years plus renewal. Um, uh, the, again, the disability onset date of five years prior, compassion allowance, and retirement. And again, all through pages three, four, and five, conforming language to reflect those changes. Um, all through pages six and seven. I'm happy to, if you, if you notice anything and you want to flag that, I'm happy to take questions, but I don't want to, it's, it's basically conforming language. All the way up to page eight. Um, which is a FELL loan program regulatory language. Again, I'll direct you to page nine. We've included everything that we've included under direct loans and Perkins. Page 10, we flagged um, the change regarding the disability onset date, conforming changes throughout to reflect certification by physician, nurse practitioner, physician, physician's assistant, or licensed uh, psychologist. Um, and conforming changes throughout, all the way through the FELL language. Um, through page 15. So that is TPD. Um, like I said, if you had any uh, discrete or technical issues as you look through the regulatory text, um, I'm happy to answer them. If you've made any um, minor technical errors, uh, we're happy to address those. Okay, let us know if you have any clarifying questions or comments. Bethany, please. I want to thank the department for adding this, even if it isn't automatic right now or can't be in the future. I think this will dramatically help beneficiaries who can't access some of the other documentation that is authorized to provide evidence that they meet this eligibility criteria. And I think this is a great improvement. I will just flag one small typo for y'all. Um, in C, it says um, at, at least five years prior for the onset date, but it then says a least five years prior um, for receiving benefits. So you might just want to make that an at rather than a an A. Um, but aside from that, we're very pleased to see this. Thank you so much for doing that. Um, we're we're really happy with this language. Jennifer, let me know. Do we want to make a live edit here to add that T? Um, I flagged it. I, Vanessa, can you can you throw that to in there um, on page seventeen in the highlight? We could do it simultaneously to fielding questions for, um, yeah, the latter part of that sentence for at least five years. Thank you. Thank you. Jay, please go ahead. Um, so thank you for the fell regulations. Just uh, believe a technical correction. I'm on page 13, the bottom. So you struck seven, which um, pertain to the three year conditional period. So then I think there's a renumbering. Um, eight becomes seven. I think nine wasn't included here, but that's our VATPD. And then um, so on. So I just wanted to raise that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jay. Thank you for that. I flying that. So um, Vanessa, real quickly, if you want to. We basically skipped over seven. Is that is that right, Jay? Yes, yeah, so you yeah. struck seven, which makes sense. And so eight becomes seven. Thanks for catching it. So on page 14, Vanessa. Oh, you got it. Okay, she's a step ahead of me. One second. And then you have um ten. There's a there's a Section nine that wasn't included here because there were no changes, I believe, for VA. That's right. Yeah, that's a little bit. Right. And I like, is 10 all new or 10? 
that I was a little confused about, but I could just be looking at the wrong version of regs, but I have no concerns. I just, okay. I think 10 is now nine. I think that's right, and we'll just double check that internally, but we could go ahead and make that change for 10 to 9. 10 is not all new, only the, okay. red, line, only the red line is new. Only the red line. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jay and Jennifer. Really quickly, I want to note, Carol is in for proprietary institutions. Will is in for federal family education, loan lenders, and or guarantee agencies. And John Whitelaw is coming to the table for groups representing individuals with disabilities. Justin, please go ahead. Thanks so much. Actually, it was just going to comment on the red line on 10 there, but also uh, paragraph D. More broadly, the discharge without an application provisions throughout the language. Wanted to thank the department for making clear how they intend these provisions to operate. So uh, you'll probably be hearing similar thanks as we go through some of the other texts, but thank you. Okay, thank you, Justin. Any other comments or questions from the committee? Persis, please. Yeah, I just wanted to echo the appreciation of Justin and Bethany. Um, I think the changes that the department has made during it, uh, in the TPD are going to do huge things for the um, the borrowers that we've worked with. Um, in particular, eliminating the monitoring period, which I realized was a week one issue, but is a, was a very big barrier for many of the people to actually see in the relief, as well as some of the more technical um, elements that the department is changing, um, including the allowing signatures by a wider range um, of medical professionals. Um, that is going to have a huge impact. So we are very appreciative of that. Uh, along with the automation, because as with all things, just carrying forward the themes, um, automating as much as possible is hugely important. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Persis. Carol, please. I don't have a concern on number six on page five. As I mentioned in a prior session with the reinstatement of discharge loans, if a new TEACH grant or direct loan is taken out within three years after the date of discharge, as we're all aware, the process of being approved for disability is lengthy and then followed by the process of the TPD discharge. So this could leave a disabled individual unable to rejoin society on another career after seeking to attain a career focused education, some sort of training or certification that might be eligible for teach grant or for which a student might need to use federal direct student loans in order to return to school or to receive that training. It just seems like an unreasonable amount of time to keep a disabled individual from being able to feel as if they can rejoin society, have purpose, be functional in a, in a different career. And most schools have a process of confirming with students after they've received a TPD discharge that um, they have the approval of their primary caregiver to enroll in school and specifically in that career field for which they are seeking an education and that they would be viable in that industry and able to perform and be successful considering that disability. Um, and schools typically are counseling students to let them know that future discharge of loans would most likely not be eligible unless there is an additional disability that, it, that takes place. Typically, these students are already working with a voc rehab counselor, occupational therapy, therapist, or another professional and are approved for coming back into some different type of program or career field. And of special concern are veterans that are working with voc rehab counselors that have possibly received a TPD discharge for a prior uh, career field or approved to come back into one for which they would be eligible for TEACH grant. I know that that wouldn't make them uh, disqualified for VA benefits, but I would hate to discriminate against a veteran and not allow them to be eligible for TEACH grant, which would then cause that uh, reinstatement alone. So my suggestion would be a standardized process for recording exception that would allow for the awarding of TEACH grant or new direct student loan anytime after the TPD discharge with the approval of a healthcare professional for the program of enrollment that states and recognizes the viability of the career choice for the student given their disability, that would not cause a reinstatement of a TPD discharge, but would disqualify current loans or future loans from being able for discharge or being eligible for discharge 
unless the student becomes further disabled and unable to function in the new career field. Okay, thank you, Carol. Jennifer, I see your hand. Yes, I want to get back to Carol. Um, but before that, it just occurred to me why Jay may have been um, confused. And I just wanted to point out again, the auto discharge language, remember, we just published in August. So I don't even know if those have been codified in the ECFR. So that may be why you didn't see it, Jay, but that is the current regulatory language um, is, is the auto discharge, but that wasn't published until August, um, our, our final rule um, for auto discharge. To Carol's point, remember the, um, the, vet, the veterans, the VA, the veterans are not subject to reinstatement. Um, so they, and, and as you just mentioned, um, so long as they have a physician certification um, and they can de demonstrate their eligibility to uh, withdraw those loans, then, um, and certify that they would be paying them back, that they would not be subject to discharge unless their condition worsens, um, their loans won't be instated, at least for the veterans. There's also a concern for other students as well. That's a significant population. Great. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Jennifer. I misspoke earlier. It's actually Jay at the table for federal family education loan lenders and or guarantee agencies. So for the record, Will's not at the table, but Jay is. John, please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Just one clarification. I just wanted to make sure I understood what I think Jennifer said, which is while there is no currently an automated process for folks who meet the five year rule or the five year time limit, the current process would be you apply and you show documentation from Social Security that is acceptable to the Department of Education that you meet that requirement and then you get the loan forgiven. I just wanna make sure I understand that that's what her limit was on the automation part and that this is in fact a full-blown new substantive category of eligibility subject to possible automation depending on what ED and SSA can come up with, but automation is not, is not um, um, sort of really the subject of, of this rule other than in the bigger general sense. And then with that aside, I want to echo what um, uh, Bethany said and that, that we are um, extremely pleased by the department's um, willingness and enthusiasm to uh, expand the groups of folks who meet the statutory de um, definition and who were excluded previously by basis of not fitting the right social security um, labels. And we think that this is a, a significant improvement in that regard. And we look forward to working with the department to um, be creative about how to automate those. And we also look forward to working with the department to improving the physician certification form, which we understand the nitty gritty of the form is not the subject of this rulemaking, but we do anticipate that we will be have ongoing discussions with the department once all is said and done about making that form user friendly for people with um, disabilities. And that's pretty much all I have to say. Thank you, John. Jennifer, did you have something on that? Yes, just to affirm um, that I agree with your characterization of it, John. We, um, we need to have those data available and provided to us by SSA by way of agreement um, and for us to be able to auto discharge. Um, however, we will accept um, that as part of the application provided by the borrower. That's what this proposal codifies. Great. I just wanted to make sure I understood properly. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, John. Jerry, please. Hello, everyone. I, again, I just want to echo the thanks for the changes and the amount of people that it's going to affect. I just want to clarify one thing. This will not help anybody in a spousal loan, correct, if one person becomes disabled? 
Right. It's the borrower that has to demonstrate the dis- disability. Okay. Um, I, I will be submitting a letter from uh, one of my constituents that uh, the the one the primary borrower um, would have qualified under the cancer um, certification after Agent Orange um, exposure, um, but his wife is um, was not, and so they were denied the discharge uh, because of that spousal loan. Um, so just a reminder about that if that's not covered. Thank you, Jerry. Bethany, please. So I actually, um, again, really appreciate everything the department has done here. Uh, to Carol's point, because I think that this is something that I certainly did a lot of thinking about when we started out these negotiations. And one, I would just say the VR system is, the, they are required under law to pay for education services that people who are in vocational rehabilitation are supposed to be receiving. They don't often, but that is something that the VR system is technically supposed to do. So I would actually say this is much access to further educational opportunities for people with disabilities is something that VR is on the hook for, not ed. And that's something that I would actually argue VR should be taking a look at rather than ed. Um, just so Carol is aware of that. And secondly, um, I don't disagree. I think the, the statutory authorization that Ed has on this point is kind of an interesting discussion because it is a may authority rather than a shall authority. I can drop the kind of citations in the, in the chat, but I really do think, I mean, I do think this is more of a VR problem than an Ed problem for what it's worth. Um, I don't know that that helps in this context. And I mean, I'm certainly happy to revisit if we see problems popping up with people wanting to take advantage of further educational opportunities and that not being possible given all of this. But um, I would really direct more of my complaints on this to the VR system. Okay, thank you, Bethany. I appreciate all of the comments from the group. Now that we have walked through total and permanent disability discharge, I'm going to suggest that we take an official consensus check on what has been proposed in this paper. To meet the um, request of the group, what I would ask is that everyone hold up their thumb and I will read aloud your name and the station of your thumb so that it does in fact go into the transcript as requested. So please hold them high and in front of the screen and hold them up while I review all of the thumbs for purposes of the transcript. I will be looking for 18 thumbs. Daniel, thumbs up. Noelia, thumbs up. Jerry, thumbs up. Persis, thumbs up. Jennifer, thumbs up. Heather, thumbs up. Dixie, thumbs up. David, thumbs up. Bobby, thumbs up. Jay, thumbs up. Justin, thumbs up. Misty, thumbs up. Marjorie, thumbs up. Carol, thumbs up. Joe, thumbs up. Bethany, thumbs up. Michaela, thumbs up. Anne, is it your intent to express a thumb on this particular issue? No. Then we have all thumbs up. The committee is in consensus and you have reached an agreement on total and permanent disability discharge. Congratulations to the committee. All right. What I would suggest is that we move into our next issue. If we are prepared to do that, Jennifer, I'm going to turn it over to you to walk us through closed school discharge. May I, before we begin, may I ask for a caucus? Um, I need a brief caucus, I'm hoping. Um, I'd like to have a caucus with accrediting agencies and proprietary institutions on this issue. And I'd like to invite the Fed negotiator in, uh, the Ed negotiator in for a brief part of that caucus after we have a moment um, as proprietary institutions, financial administrators, crediting institutions. Um, am I missing anyone, Heather, in that piece? No. So if we can have the three of us, um, and then I would like to invite, once we're on um, the same footing, I'd like to invite um, the Fed negotiator, Jennifer, to join us as well. All right, at this time, what I'm going to do while the FMCS team works with the technology to set up this particular caucus, I'm gonna ask that we end the live streaming so that we can maneuver these things. And then we will come back to live streaming when we are all returning to the main table. Can you announce when we are no longer live?
Okay, thank you all for your patience and your work during that caucus time. We are now back and are going to return to the issue of closed school discharge. Before we do, I do want to acknowledge Suzanne Martindale on behalf of State Higher Education Executive Officers and Josh on behalf of Legal Aid at the Table. Um, Jennifer, can I turn it over to you to begin the conversation around closed school discharge? Yes, thank you, Kayla. Um, if we could go ahead and cue closed school discharge language. Um, just like TPD, we came to you with direct loan language only under uh, sessions one and two. We have gone back and made substantial changes, substantive changes um, to the reg text. Um, and we've also provided Perkins and Fell language as well. So why don't I do the same thing and start on page 15 with direct loan language so I can point out the substantive change and then we can um, field any question. In brief, um, when you go through the direct loan language, you'll notice a lot of deletions. Um, and that is because uh, many committee members had um, concerns regarding the concept of comparable program and the re-enrollment. So we've basically uh, eliminated the provisions having to do with comparable program. And what you see on page 16 and 17 in the highlight is the only condition um, remaining then is the completion of a teach out agreement. So that is, that's the only thing that's left. Um, and on page 17, the changes um, uh, reflected there um, on or after July 1st, 2023, um, state that the bar did not complete an institutional teach out plan performed by the school or teach out agreement at another school approved by the school's accrediting agency and if applicable, the school state authorizing agency. Um, so that is that under, that's the one change. The next change is under exceptional um, circumstances. Um, and this was pointed out by legal aid last time uh, was the inclusion of judgments. And we had pointed to the finding language. They had provided some alternate language to ensure that uh, judgments were included. So we've included that under paragraph six on page 22. Um, we, I'm having Vanessa bounce around everywhere again. So I'll just point out very quickly, if we go back to page one, under the Perkins uh, loan program language, um, these changes are reflected. Um, in the comment bubble uh, on page three, um, you'll see that we've removed the conforming language, remove language regarding re-enrollment comparable program criterion, retaining only completion of a teach out agreement. That's in Perkins. And then um, again, the insertion of the language on page six of uh, school violated state or federal law related to um, Uh, state or federal court judgments. Also then that's followed by the fell language. As we're going through the, as we were going through the fell language, just of note, and that's the note on page eight, um, there was quite a bit of kind of cleaning up that needed to happen with the fell regs. They hadn't been updated. And for some reason there, there were some paragraphs missing. So that's just a reinsertion of uh, existing language. For some reason, it had fallen off, which is technical in nature. Um, and again, on page 14 of the cell language, yeah, um, you can see the removal of re-enrollment comparable program criterion and the inclusion of state or federal court judgments and under exceptional circumstances. So I will um, stop right there for discussion. All right, Daniel, please. 
Sorry, dropping my pen. I have a couple of items. One is technical, one is substantive. Um, Jennifer, the, there are a couple of places in the conforming language where the word may is used when it comes to the secretary's um, discharge as opposed to shall or will. Um, it appears that way in the Perkins as well as the FFEL section. Um, um, I may be having some internet problems. Am I having internet problems? I'm back. So um, could we look at those and, and could you let us know if that's intentional or just an oversight? I'll give you an example. If you go to page two, um, uh, uh, number three on page two. Let's see. Thank you, Vanessa. Sorry. Here we go. The secretary may discharge the borrower's application to repay. That doesn't seem to match the language of will um, earlier in the document. And then there's another one on page uh, 14. So we'll flag those. It, they may be intentional, so I'm kind of hesitant to make those changes now, but we will have a look at them. And then the substantive question, I'm just going to uh, reiterate. And first of all, thank you for allowing us some time in small group. I think it helped advance the conversation. Um, I still have a concern around the definition of what constitutes a closed school. Jennifer shared some sub-regulatory guidance um, about when conditions constitute closed versus closed that are, or not closed that the department uses. Um, I'm advocating strongly for that sub-regulatory guidance to be promulgated in a much more public way um, so that institutions have a clear understanding of a further definition beyond simply what's in the regulatory guidance. Um, so I don't know if you want to share anything about that, Jennifer. That, that would be my strong recommendation. If it can't be added as regulatory and it remains sub-regulatory, ideally I'd like it actually in the regulation. But if that can't happen, then I think it needs to be very um, uh, publicly and uh, and uh, demonstratively shared. Okay, thank you, Daniel. Josh, please. Thanks. Um, so I want to start on the re-enrollment piece and just um, emphasize how appreciative the legal aid community is for that change. Uh, it is a really uh, significant change that's going to yield um, a lot of relief to a lot of people. Um, and so we we very much appreciate that change. Um, I do have two specific kind of questions for the department on it. Um, the first is whether the department has considered implementing the auto discharge provisions early, um, particularly given just the amount of, of time it's likely to take to effectuate the provisions that are in here. You know, we would, we, if the department hasn't considered that yet, we would urge the department to do so. Um, and then the second is for those students in particular who attended pre-2014, um, is the department in implementing this going to be using any presumptions? Um, and, and by that, I mean, we know, you know, that most schools pre-2014 didn't offer teach out programs that would satisfy the definition in here. And so um, I'm curious if, what, if the department has considered uh, utilizing any presumptions as it actually effectuates um, the, these proposals, which uh, just to again reiterate, we very much appreciate. Thank you, Josh. Joe, please. Hi, thanks, uh, Kayla. Can everyone hear me? Is my mic okay? We can hear you just fine. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> uh, I agree with Josh that uh, the elimination of the um, re-enrollment requirement is a uh, big plus for students, and so thanks to the department for that. Um, however, my concern here uh, remains the pegging of eligibility to a specific time frame, the 180 days. Um, again, what we see is when a closure happens, there is a lot of confusion among students. People are emotional. They're disappointed. They have a huge investment in time in addition to the money that can't be made up. And so many people 
upon hearing that the school is closing will withdraw at that point. In the event that it's outside the 180 days, a lot of people are losing eligibility there. And so I had submitted language in the first session, um, you know, with a potential fix here for, you know, pegging eligibility to when the closure is announced, because that's when students are going to make decisions. Um, so two points on that. One, query why the department has been uh, resistant to institute that change. And then two, um, although I think the ex exceptional circumstances are an inadequate fix to this problem because they require action by the department. Um, but I would like it if the department can provide um, an explanation of exceptional circumstance number seven, which is on page 14. The teach out of the student's educational program exceeds the 180 day look back period for a closed school discharge. Um, I think I know what that means, but I think um, an explanation here might might um, help understand whether that would cover the the fact pattern that uh, the AGs are concerned about. OK, thank you, Joe. Jay, please. Thanks, so I have just a, a few questions on the FELL regulations. So in terms of the teach out um, requirement, we just wanted to verify under the FELL program, if it's the guarantors that are making those approvals, do they just accept the borrower's self-certification on the application? That's how we understood it, but we wouldn't have data to validate. Um, we were wondering also about the triggering event, also related to the teach out provision that's on or after 7-1-2023. And what is that referring to? Is it applications received? Is it school closures on or after that date? So just interested in any clarity there. Um, and then for the, the no application, am I correct in assuming those would be the department would be notifying the guarantor in those situations, those are like auto automatic discharges, just making sure I understand that in the context of our program. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. And we'll have one last comment before we go right into lunch. Jessica, please. Sure, thank you. Um, I still have significant concerns about the proposal that's been put forward. Um, the department proposes to define a closed school to include a school that has ceased to provide educational instruction for most of its students. This means that students attending schools that haven't closed are eligible for closed school loan discharges. Institutions add and discontinue program offerings all the time in response to student demand and changes in the labor market. Programmatic innovation should be encouraged so that institutions continuously improve offerings to help students succeed in the workforce. The department's proposal could be particularly damaging to small institutions like mine that want to switch up program offerings but only offer three or four programs total. Instead of starting new programs and discontinuing old programs, some colleges may keep old programs afloat simply to avoid school loan liability. The definition or the department's definition of a closed school also departs from the statute's plain meaning in the Higher Education Act. HGA says that if the borrower is unable to complete the program in which such student is enrolled due to the closure of the institution, then the secretary shall discharge the borrower's liability on the loan. To get relief under the statute, the school must have closed. But here the department is proposing awarding closed school loan relief to borrowers attending schools that are still open. The department's proposal is contrary to the plain language of the HEA. The department has made a significant shift away from the idea 
that if a student enrolls in a comparable program, they should not get loan relief. This principle has been ingrained in the department's regulations for decades, yet the department has seemingly abandoned it overnight without justification. The department's new proposal would provide loan discharges to all students who attend a school that closed, except, except those that complete an approved teach-out agreement. This creates a perverse incentive for students not to enroll in a teach-out program and transfer to another school. Indeed, it's probably more rational for a student to transfer than to participate in a teach-out. Teach-out arrangements are generally positive for students, and I'm shocked and disappointed that the department is proposing a policy that would make it financially irrational for a student to enroll in a teach-out and instead of transferring. If a student is close to completing their program when the school closes and is able to transfer all their credits, they may only need to take one or two classes at the new school, but they can still be eligible for full student loan relief under the proposal. This creates a windfall for students, seconds. which will primarily be paid by taxpayers. Lastly, and I'll be quick, the department seeks to make these changes to the closed school loan liability retroactive. The department has continually oscillated on this question of retroactivity during this negotiated rulemaking, despite clear opinions from the Supreme Court that state that regulations may only be applied prospectively unless Congress has specifically authorized retroactivity. No mention of retroactivity in Section 437C of the HEA, which authorizes school closed school loan discharges. Thank you. We are right at the lunch hour. Heather and Joe, I do see your hands, so we will start with you as soon as we come back. I hope that you all have a great lunch and we will again go live and return at the top of the hour. All right, we will see you all then. Thank you.